Hey everybody, Colton Yee here, and this is Crash Course AP English Literature, your one-stop shop for everything with words. Today, I'm going to be analyzing Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood, who also wrote A Handmaid's Tale. Both are dystopian novels. The first few pages kick off with Snowman Wakes Before Dawn, a guy named Snowman wandering around a beach just trying to survive in some sort of barren, post-apocalyptic world following a devastating plague that killed mostly everyone. Off the bat, you can tell there's going to be a lot of irony in this book, just from how the main character is presented. I mean, it's a snowman on a beach. He's not alone, though, in both a literal and metaphysical sense. Something is very obviously wrong with him psychologically because he hears these weird voices in his head from time to time from someone named Oryx. There are also these genetically modified humans that somehow survived the plague called Krakers, which are at first described as naked children of every skin color that are also resistant to UV radiation. That's not even the confusing part, personally. All they really do is bother our protagonist, Snowman, and ask him to tell him stories and such as little kids do. I'd go crazy too if all that was left in the world were me and a bunch of naked little kids bothering me. In terms of the stories that he tells to the Krakers to get them to leave him alone, he invented a whole mythology, almost like a religion with a spirit-slash-deity entity known as Crake trapped in his watch. Snowman spends his time foraging for food and supplies, just trying to survive in a bare wasteland. He raids trailer parks and cars to scrounge together anything useful, and he even has a little tree hut to keep him safe from the genetically modified crossbred animal hybrid monster things. More on those creatures later, but I can definitely see why this guy couldn't stay sane. He has these strange, chaotic outbursts of anger and sexual arousal, maybe sometimes both. He masturbates not to the children, thankfully, but to some imaginary girl named Oryx, who supposedly has painted oval nails. And that's just the first chapter. Time then flashes back to before the plague, and before Snowman was even named Snowman. Before, he was known as Jimmy. Jimmy lived on an organ factory compound with his mother and father, who were both scientists who worked for the factory. The staple product of this farm slash factory was pagoons, which were animals genetically modified to grow extra organs to be harvested for human medical use. This sort of contextualizes the weird hybrid animals from the first chapter, as it's pretty obvious that something is going to go terribly wrong with whatever those things are. The compound has its own functioning micro-society inside of it, complete with a school that Jimmy goes to. It's quarantined off from the rest of the world, known as the Pleblands, a play on the word plebeian. What's important to note at this point is the relationship between Jimmy's mom and dad. They juxtapose each other in that Jimmy's mother is disgusted by the sacrilege and corruption of the whole business of their compound, accusing the company of ripping people off and being a moral cesspool. Jimmy's father, on the other hand, sees the whole organ harvesting ordeal as nothing more than interactions with cells, tissues, and proteins, and is much more detached to the moral obligations Jimmy's mother is preoccupied with. It's worth noting that Jimmy's father even gave Jimmy a pet rakunk, which is a hybrid, genetically spliced raccoon skunk. It is again ironic here because as the reader, we know that in the earlier chapters, Snowman had to fend off the same genetically modified animal hybrid monsters just to survive. So we wouldn't expect Jimmy, who is Snowman, to have one of those creatures as a pet named Killer to boot. Jimmy's mother eventually becomes so depressed and guilty that she leaves the compound entirely, noting how heavy her conscience would have been otherwise in a note she left for Jimmy, and she even takes his rakunk with her. After that, one of Jimmy's father's co-workers moves in with them, named Ramona, who Jimmy fa- Jimmy's father is implied to have some sort of affair with. Then the flashbacks to Snowman's childhood as Jimmy shifts in focus from, ho- li- from home life, excuse me, and or the compound he lived in, to the school he goes to. It's there that he becomes friends with Glenn, later known as Crake, who juxtaposes Jimmy as his opposite in a couple of ways. Jimmy is a self-described words person, an excuse he falls back on when his parents used to argue about his intellectual inferiority, whereas Glenn is a numbers person who excels at math and science. Glenn is not much of a sports person. Jimmy, on the other hand, plays tennis. The two spend their time playing violent video games or on Glenn's uncle's computer, browsing online gore, porn, or combinations of all three. 
Glenn's username on one such violent game, Extinctathon, is Crake. One day, while browsing child porn, they come across a little girl who supposedly becomes Oryx. I say supposedly because Snowman masturbates to her and explicitly imagines the sensation of touch in the most vivid yet disturbing tactile imagery I've seen in a long time, but it's vivid enough to question whether or not Snowman is even imagining the presence of Oryx, or perhaps he's remembering something from the past, since there is a time skip to consider. That would explain the depth and clarity of his masturbation sessions, but I think that's enough about that. There are some lengthy flashbacks concerning Oryx, as her physical appearance and innocent smile have garnered the attention of a great deal of both the sex trafficking industry and the acting industry. She sold flowers outside hotel lobbies, starred in porn films, and a bunch of other stuff I'm not going to mention. Jimmy and Craig end up going to different colleges. Craig is, is auctioned off to a prestigious university compared to real-life Harvard before it got drowned. Jimmy's grades are pretty subpar when compared to his peers, but in the larger scheme of things, he would have actually been pretty smart by comparison if he had gone to a module school, or the public school system. Since his education was through the compound, rife with geniuses like Craig, Jimmy's had some stiff academic competition. <coughs> FCPS. He ends up going to a lackluster humanities school to study marketing. Jimmy and Craig go on a little gap vacation in between, you could call it, after their high school graduation, and Margaret Atwood finally decides to shed some light onto what is happening in the outside world. Jimmy and Craig are watching news stories and footage of a slew of riots and civil unrest around the world, but when Jimmy and Craig are talking about who to support, the, prote the protesters or the corporate entities they're protesting against, Jimmy realizes that his upbringing actually might affect how he sees things, because Jimmy supports the company that's being protested against. Jimmy reflects here on his childhood, growing up inside a similar corporate compound factory farm thing, so it makes sense that he's biased towards big business. Jimmy's college life just sucks. It sucks. The campus that was falling apart comprised of wood metal sheds, no recreational facilities apart from a pool that looks and smells like a sardine can, no air conditioning or electrical power, and a variety of cockroaches and other bugs and critters in the dorms. Jimmy and Craig keep in touch in college via email, and Jimmy laments to Craig about how much college life sucks, as well as any new creatures he finds crawling around his room. As for Craig, he never really mentions anything other than some descriptions of his campus facilities and bio-research gizmos. Craig does end up telling Jimmy about how much the academic rigor has amped up compared to their high school, and how everyone there is an NT, or neurotypical. Jimmy spends some, t some of his time writing term papers, which contrasts against the rest of the student population who just plagiarizes them off the net since the scorekeeping system at Jimmy's college is notoriously lax. When he's not doing that, he's in the library reading a varied assortment of books in order to gather source material for comedic routines in student pubs, ranging from self-help books to the 12-step plan for assisted suicide, how to make friends and influence people, flat abs in five weeks, and grief management for dummies. Jimmy ends up visiting Craig at his campus and is shocked because compared to his college, Craig lives in a palace. They have algae farms, smart wallpaper that changes based on your mood, and maids too. They also have chicken farms, but not just any chicken farm. They grow each part of the chicken, like the breasts and the thighs and things, independently. Now Jimmy, having grown up on an organ farm, is pretty familiar with this process, to say the least, but even he is disturbed by this because at least the pigoons from his childhood had heads. The chickens just have mouths, since that's the only part they need to feed them, in Craig's words. Jimmy goes so far as to describe them as animal protein tubers. Then Craig takes Jimmy to a genetically modified dog compound where we're introduced to the violent wolf-dog hybrid thing Snowman had to defend himself in against in the future, called Wolvogs. Then all of a sudden, Craig says, Hey Jimmy, what if you were a pharmaceutical company that has already cured every disease known to man? And Jimmy says, Um, I don't know, make more cures? And Craig says, No, you would make more diseases. That's big foreshadowing. Remember the plague that Snowman survived at the beginning of the book? The stark contrast between the college lives of Jimmy and Craig make me wonder what Margaret Atwood's school life was like, but that's beside the point. Fast forward through some confusing flashbacks, or maybe 
flash forwards, I should say, of Snowman exploring a dystopian wasteland, and Jimmy has graduated college and lives with his girlfriend Amanda. He lands a job writing advertisement pamphlets for a company called A New You, spelled like that. He finds this incredibly boring and becomes addicted to sex and alcohol. He and Craig, like before, keep in touch via email while Craig works at a similar compound to the one Jimmy grew up in, only much more prestigious, known as Rejuvenescence. One day, he sees a news story about some child sex trafficking scandal in San Francisco and some little girls that were being interviewed, one of them being Oryx. Jimmy recognizes her from the child porn site that he and Craig were on during their high school days. As for Snowman, flashing forward now, it turns out that he was actually exploring a derelict rejuvenescence compound, scavenging for food and supplies. He told the Krakers, the naked little children from the beginning of the book, that he had to go alone. More foreshadowing. And he even cuts his foot on some glass, which unfortunately gets infected. Then, back to Jimmy, he gets a letter telling him that his mom had been executed for treason, which, for some reason, takes a whole chapter to get across. Then, as if the flashbacks and flash-forwards weren't enough to confuse me, Jimmy has these cryptic dreams and visions of his dead mom. At some point, Craig comes to visit and invites him to go hang out in the plea blands, which, if you'll remember from Jimmy's childhood compound days, is their word for the outside world. Craig even offers Jimmy a job at the rejuvenescent compound he works at, where he's now a higher-up. There's this little dome at the center of the compound called Paradise, which turns out to be one of the projects Craig was working on and assigned Jimmy to, which is one of the first connections between the future and the past in the book, in terms of the two timelines. This is probably a sign that the two timelines are eventually going to come together, forming a peak at the end. As for the weird dreams that Jimmy has, I'm really not too sure. As Craig is giving Jimmy a tour of the fancy compound, he explains two of their main initiatives going forward. One is the Bliss Plus pill, a sexual wellness product. Jimmy's assigned to its ad campaign. Then Craig mentions how the Allies, after World War II, invited German rocket scientists to come work for them, which will become important in a second, because in Craig's office, he has this very mysterious poem on a fridge magnet. Where God is, man is not. There are two moons. The one you can see, and the one you can't. Du musst den Leben erden. I, I don't know how to say that, I'm sorry. We understand more than we know. I think, therefore. To stay human is to break a limitation. Dream steals from its lair towards its prey. There's a lot to unpack here, because this might be a thematic statement in disguise. In a nutshell, though, this shows the metaphysical philosophy of Craig and his company that he works for, in that they may be attempting to change the nature of life itself and skew the relationship between themselves and God and perhaps their roles as human beings. The allusion to the Germans in World War II, in the context of Craig, may be implying that they're creating some sort of weaponry, biological, I would assume, especially given the hypothetical situation Craig told Jimmy before, with a pharmaceutical company running out of diseases to cure. Anyways, the second initiative Paradise is responsible for, other than dystopian Viagra, uh, are the Krakers, the naked people snowmen has had so much trouble with. Craig shows Jimmy some floor models of them as if they were in a furniture store. As Craig explains it, they're essentially genetically modified seven-year-olds designed to drop dead at age 30 and be immune to all diseases. Then, it turns out Oryx was actually an employee of Craig's company, who took care of the Krakers and taught them basic survival skills. She also distributed the Bliss Plus pills throughout the sex industry, given her background as a sex worker. Then, Craig goes into how he met her, and his heavily implied sexual relationship with her, much to Jimmy's dismay. The three of them meet, and Oryx tells Craig that the Krakers asked her who their creator was, like a robot that has somehow just gained sentience. Oryx tells them that Craig himself made them, and that he was kind and good. This sort of contextualizes the religion mythology Snowman conjures up when the future Krakers ask him to tell him stories. Then Oryx and Jimmy have sex. I'm not sure if Jimmy consented all the way, but it happened. Then, during their affair at some point, Oryx tells Jimmy to take care of the Krakers if something ever happened to her and or Crake. Sure enough, she goes out for pizza and never returns. 
Then the plague I was talking about before breaks out and Oryx tells Jimmy that it just so happens that the Bliss Pus pills were laced with it all along. Jimmy is safe in the quarantined airlocked Paradise Dome and he tries to get in touch with Crake, who sounds drunk over the phone. Jimmy and three other employees hunker down and watch the news while Jimmy waits for Oryx. Then outside the airlock, Crake appears demanding to be let in, but Jimmy isn't having it because Crake himself said not to let anyone in because they could be carriers of the disease. Crake reassures Jimmy that everything is okay as Jimmy lets him in deeper into the compound, but over a security camera, Jimmy sees that Crake is just a wreck, clothes all torn up and covered in blood. Jimmy preemptively aims down the hallway with a gun as the last door opens, revealing that Crake is holding a knife in one hand and a motionless oryx. Craig says, I'm counting on you, as he slits her throat, and Jimmy shoots him. As the plague wipes out the rest of humanity, and Oryx and Craig decompose in the hallway, Jimmy is left with a choice to make. Stay with or abandon the Craigers, who are largely unaffected by everything that just happened. Realizing he and the Craigers could not stay forever in the decaying compound, he dons his snowman persona and leads the Krakers to the shore from the very beginning of the book. As for current snowman, he was gathering supplies from the decrepit facility and was heading back to the shore with the Krakers when they tell him that they saw three others that looked like him, clothed human beings, two men, one woman. Jimmy, elated, sets out to find them the next morning, and they are sitting around a fire at the beach. The book ends here, remaining ambiguous about what he does next. As such, Snowman wakes before dawn.